There are lots of different types of stars, and in fact, this list that I'm going to show you is hardly exhaustive. There's tons more than these, but we're going to talk about single stars, binary stars, and we're going to talk about three different types of those, as well as red giants and white dwarfs. But there are so many other kinds. So there are things like neutron stars and pulsars and sea feed variables and, uh, you know, our, our Lyra stars. There's, there's tons of different types of stars. But anyway, um, the main things to cover are these. So single stars are just that, only one star. An example could be our sun. So, I mean, for our sun, all we have is just, you know, our sun with, you know, then we just have the planets around it and that's it. All right, so we just have our sun and that's it. Well, that's a bit boring. So let's maybe take a look at binary stars. Now, if something is binary, bi means two. So if something or if a, sort of a, a system um, or stars are what we call a binary, that means we have two stars and they are gravitationally bound. Now what do we mean by that? We mean that they're close enough to each other. Gravitationally bound. Sorry, I should try not to speak too much when I'm writing or else I get uh, a little bit lost. There we go. So two stars that are gravitationally bound. In other words, they orbit each other. So an example of that could be, uh, let's say we have um, one large star right here, let's just say we'll call it Big M, and we have a smaller star, let's call it Little M, you know, that would be its mass. Now the way they would actually orbit, this is kind of funny, a lot of people think that the biggest one stays still and the smallest one just goes around, but that's not the case. They actually orbit their own sort of center of mass. So in this case here, the bigger one should probably not move as much, so maybe it only goes like this right here, maybe like that. Whereas the bigger one, uh, sorry, the smaller one, that one will orbit sort of a much, much larger orbit like this right here. Let's just say something like that. And of course, they're going to be opposites to each other. So let's say this one here is going this way, then that one will be going that way. So they're sort of dancing around each other. Now, um, I think it might be fun to show you a little demonstration here. So. Here, again, is this P-H-E-T, so that's, uh, that's from University of Colorado. They have some great animations, and this is one right here called My Solar System. So what I'm going to do here is, uh, instead of selecting presets, I'm just going to play around with the mass of body 2. So body 1 is going to have a mass of 200 arbitrary units, and body 2 is going to have a mass of only 5. So this is going to simulate sort of like a, a star and a tiny little planet you know, beside it. So of course what happens is the planet orbits around the star, but look very carefully, look at the star though, the star is wobbling a bit, the star is actually moving. And by the way, this is the key thing that we, uh, actually that astronomers use in order to try to detect unseen planets around other stars. What we do is we can't really see the planet because it's so small compared to the star, and uh, well not really so small, but it's it doesn't give off uh, light like the star does. Suppose it could reflect a tiny little bit of light, but uh, it's very, very small. So if you want to detect an exoplanet, that's what we call these planets around other stars, what you would have to do then is look at the star itself. So imagine you couldn't see this little uh, purplish, pinkish one here. Imagine you didn't see that. You only looked at the star itself. Turns out if you can detect a star wobbling like this, then you can know something about uh, the thing that's orbiting it. Turns out uh, you can tell a lot of things by the type of star and how much it's wobbling. You can tell the mass of this planet, you can tell its orbital radius, you can even estimate its temperature on this planet. So that's something really important. But of course now we're looking at stars. So what should we do then? What if we have a binary system like I was talking about? Well if it's a binary system maybe we make this uh, heavier. So maybe I make it 50 arbitrary units. So now it's a lot more massive. Now look what it does then, it causes this more massive one here to deviate a lot more. So do you notice then they're sort of orbiting each other. Now orbits should not be uh, circular, they're normally elliptical. So this is right here, these are going to make ellipses. Um, what if I made them even closer in size? So what if I made the second one 150? Well then they're going to really orbit each other a lot. So look what they do now. This is really sort of like a cosmic dance, I guess you could say. 
And what if this one right here then was, I don't know, 200? Now then we can take a look at that. And now they have equal masses. That means they're really just going to do this sort of thing. Of course, you can have lots of fun and say, well, what happens with a binary star with a planet? And those have actually been detected now. So we've actually seen systems where, uh, let's say, body one is a mass of 150 units. The purple one is going to have a mass of 120. And we're going to have a tiny little planet um, that has a mass of 0 0.001. And let's sort of start the clock and see what happens. Look at this little planet, what happens to it? So it's sort of, it's sort of orbiting this star right here, but this star is sort of orbiting around this one right here. So in other words, the purple and the yellow ones are sort of orbiting each other, and this tiny little one is sort of like buzzing around it. So that's sort of, I mean, although it looks messy, it's kind of fun to see that uh, you can see what sort of happens. Now, of course, you could have things like a four-star ballet, which um, is a theoretical thing. So what if you had four stars all orbiting each other? I don't believe this has ever actually been detected, but if you did, this is how it could actually look. This would be a stable orbit system like this right here. So this is something that could theoretically work. Uh, now, they call it four-star ballet for a reason. It looks kind of funny, but what we've actually detected, though, we have detected tons and tons and tons of binary stars. Okay, so binaries are very, very common. These are not rare in any way. Okay, so we see lots of binary stars when we look up in the sky. Now let's talk about different types. So we have visual binary stars. Now those are things that when we, um, I mean, we actually see them. So if it's a visual binary, we actually see them. I'll say uh, with the naked eye or with the uh, or with a telescope. Oops, with naked eye, and I mean naked. I don't mean like nude. I mean, you know, unaided. So with unaided eye or a telescope. So what that means is um, if we take a picture of the sky, let's say, and we look up somewhere, so let's say we're looking at, actually there's a situation like this right here, there's one like this right here, let's say we're looking, this is our field of view in the telescope, and we're looking and we see some sort of big massive star here, and we see a dimmer little star right here. That's something actually similar to what there really is for Alpha Centauri B, for example. And this star over here is called Alpha Centauri A. So let's say we take a picture here, and then I'll say later we take a picture. And this time we see that this one right here maybe is up here, maybe the A is up here, and maybe the little one is down here. So clearly we've seen that these are here have been sort of shifted, they're moving. And if we watch them very carefully, we see them both sort of dancing around each other. So that's a visual binary. We call it that for a reason, right? Binary because it's two stars orbiting each other. Visual because we can actually see it and detect it directly. Well, that's not the only kind. There's also something called spectroscopic binary. So this is something where... Um, well, let's maybe write it out here. So something that's a spectroscopic binary, what we do is we detect these with a spectrum or with a spectra of stars. Now what this actually means is this. Let's just say we look at this situation down here. So this could be a, an example of a spectroscopic binary. So this here is going to be star B here. So this is star B we're looking at. So is this. This would be star A, which we're not really caring about so much. So let's just say we're just looking at star B. And as it goes around, I mean, when it's coming, this is us, by the way. So this is like maybe over here. Maybe this right here is the Earth. So this right here, I'm just trying to color it in here. I'm not doing a very good job, but that's Earth. So on Earth, then, we get the light coming from these. So over here then, technically the, you know, when this one here is like this, maybe I'll actually delete that. I'll just say, okay, over here, when it's coming towards us, like this right here, and over here, it's going away from us. That's so why they say approaching us, and over here, it's receding from us. Those are two different sort of extremes here. Of course, it does a lot of things in the middle. But let's just say we're detecting it over here on Earth. We're looking at the spectrum of star B. We're going to see these different lines. So let's, uh, let's assume these white lines are here. Those are sort of the reference. Those are the lines we're going to see normally, the white ones. Do you notice over here the white ones are at the same places? So let's just say we see those white lines. 
And what we would do is, as it's approaching us, then what would happen? Well, if something's coming towards us, we know that things right here should be blue shifted. So because of that, these right here will be blue shifted. Remember, these lines are going to be blue shifted, which means where they will be white over here, they've actually they've all moved to the left by some amount. All of them have. All by the same amount. So they're all going to be blue shifted. So they should be over here, and all the lines have moved. Of course, at the other extreme, when it's going away, well, what happens then? They're red shifted lines. And red means, you know, larger wavelength. Remember, because this one right here, this represents the wavelength here in meters. So that just means that over here then, here we have these lines right here, they're all sort of shifted towards this side right here. They're all red shifted, like that. So we might actually detect these lines right here that are red shifted. And if we see them shifted towards the red, then what that tells us is this star is going away from us. So if we see it shifted from going away from us, towards us, away from us, towards us, that we can infer that because these lines, these spectral lines are going to basically, if you imagine all these ones are here dancing to the left, and all these same lines then are going to dance to the right, and then dance to the left. So imagine you're looking at all these lines. All the lines are going to go sort of to the right, then to the left, then to the right, then to the left. As they go to the right, they're red shifted, which means it's going away from us. As they go left, they're blue shifted and coming towards us. So that's an example of a spectroscopic binary. And again, spectroscopic, very nerdy word, but it just means we take the light from the star, we break it up into its spectrum, and then we take a look at those lines. And the last type is called eclipsing binary. Oops, maybe I'll just uh, do that. So there was spectroscopic binary, now there's eclipsing binary. Now an eclipsing binary, that's kind of neat, um, that's when one goes in front of the other. Okay, so one star passes in front of the other. So what happens then? We say eclipsing just because an eclipse is when one thing passes in front of another. So let's just say we have stars A and B here. Now, uh, this right here is star B. This over here is star A. So this is A always. Let's say this blue one here. And then we have uh, star B, of course, is right here, and over here it's down there, and over here it's behind it. Now what happens is, as we see it over here, now we're not going to visually see this, though. This is what's really happening, but if we actually saw these stars doing this, if we actually took pictures of them, then we would say it was actually a visual binary. We'd say, oh, there they are, they're spinning around each other. But no, what's happening is this. All we can tell is the apparent brightness of this particular star. So, although this is what's really happening, here's all we see. We see the apparent brightness of a star just go, whoa, it goes down and then back up, and then goes down again and back up. And we can see that uh, what's really happening is this. Look carefully here. Over here we have the light. If you look at it, um, I mean, we have the components, you know, the parts of a light from this bright star right here. Um, and that light is actually coming right towards us. I'm not sure where these things are here went, but I guess I'll just label them again. So now we have uh, A here, A here, A, and A. So if we consider these ones, take a look. What we're doing then is, uh, oops, for some reason, yeah, I think I had copied this uh, file here. So I'm just going to delete this page. There we go. So if we look at this, then we have a one star passes in front. Here we go. And what we would do then, as we're seeing this right here happen, look carefully. Over here we see the light, all of the light from star A gets to us, and all the light from star, from star B gets to us, which means when we look at the apparent brightness, it's going to be this amount plus this amount, so it's that line. Look what happens over here at this extreme over here. We see all the light here and all the light here, that's why it's back up at the top. But look what happens over here. Right here, star B is in front of star A. So that means that star B's light, all of that reaches us, but we don't see all of A, because B is in front of it. So because of that, we see less of A. See, it's like, it's like we always saw all of B, we always saw all of B, we saw all of B. What happened here, though, is that we saw less of A here, when it was in front of it, because star B has eclipsed star A. 
then what happens later on is this and the other extreme is this one right here over here star b is behind it so we only see all of star a and look very carefully then what that means that means look at these dips here we have one dip that goes down a certain amount and we have another dip that goes down even more right because we actually have sort of uh, different amounts of light here. So when we see these sort of uneven dips like this are here and they're periodic, in other words they sort of happen one after the other and another another, uh, then we can tell this is an eclipsing binary situation.